Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, The Utility of Echocardiography in Patients with VADs. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. On the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the request support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASE CEU credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Jeffrey Howe. Dr. Howe is the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Cardiologist and an Assistant Professor of Cardiology at Wake Forest Baptist Health in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular diseases, and adult echo. Dr. Howe is a member of the American Heart Association, the American Medi Medical Association, and the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. A true expert in the field, and we are happy to have him with us today. And with that said, I will turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Howe. Doctor? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. For the next 50 minutes, we will be discussing the utility of echocardiography in patients with ventricular assist devices, or VADs for short. Um, before we proceed, I'd like to thank the IAC for the invitation to give this talk. <clears throat> I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, for the first part of our talk, we'll focus on how echocardiography can be helpful in defining which acute mechanical circulatory support device or percutaneous VAD will be in the management of cardiogenic shock. And then part two of the talk, we transition to patients who are supported by durable or surgically placed LVADs. Uh, we go through the, the indications and then troubleshooting uh, indications. All right, so without much further ado, we start with the uh, percutaneous uh, VADs or temporary VADs. <clears throat> The biggest reason uh, why a uh, percutaneous uh, ventricular assistive support device is placed is number one, to aid in revascularization of high-risk PCIs. It serves as support for high-risk lesions, oftentimes too surgically uh, complex uh, or high risk uh, to proceed in with surgical revascularization. The second reason would be as a bridge to recovery or a bridge to more options uh, with regard to advanced heart failure therapies. In two broad categories, I, I classify them into an acute phase, and still the most common cause of acute cardiogenic shock among adult patient population is acute myocardial infarction. Other examples would be uh, acute myocarditis and post-cardiotomy shock. <clears throat> For patients who have already known systolic heart failure, uh, they can also progress to shock when their disease state has progressed towards end stage. Um, in these instances, the implantation of percutaneous VADs can be helpful as a bridge to decision to more advanced heart failure therapies, whether it's via durable VAD or heart transplantation. 
We know for a long time now that increasing use of um, inotropes and pressors are associated with poor outcomes, but this study elegantly showed that as soon as the number of pressors exceed, uh, reach around two, the mortality rate significantly increases. And as we increase the number of pressors or inotropes to three and beyond, the mortality reaches almost 80%. And so the answer to management of patients with shock is not always with more vasopressors and inotropes. And there's data to suggest that time is of essence that once you start reaching uh, at least two well, or two inotropes and vasopressors, it's time to call your friendly interventional cardiologist. And for this reason, we, have, we are seeing more and more percutaneous fads placed with the hope of helping to wean our inotropes and vasopressors and actually improve the metabolic abnormalities associated with cardiogenic shock. When you take a look at this slide, um, it, it comes very complex, but let me walk you through these uh, one by one. Um, first, when we take a look at this uh, slide, I'd like you to first say which subventricle it needs support. So the left ventricle has the following support devices available uh, to support it. And the right ventricle on the lower screen will have different support devices available to support it. The next thing I'd like you to think about is where the blood is being, the chamber from where it's being drained to where it's being displaced to. So the balloon pump requires an intrinsic uh, cardiac contractility and perfusing rhythm in order to uh, ej help eject blood from the left ventricle towards the aorta on systole, where the balloon pump collapses, and on diastole, it improves, it pushes the blood back to improve coronary perfusion. In patients who have these impellas or percutaneous heart pumps, this is an arterially placed device and then traverses the entire aorta, crosses the aortic valve, and then snorkels into the left ventricle. So in this pump, blood is being shunted from the LV, and then ejected in the ascending aorta. The tandem heart, on the other hand, is a device that's femorally accessed, a femoral vein access, and then through it passes through the right atrium, traverses the interatrial septal, uh, septum, one has to make a puncture there, and then is landed at the left atrium. So blood is being shunted or drained from the left atrium, oxygenated blood, and then uh, delivered to the peripheral <clears throat> arterial vasculature, not oftentimes in the distal aorta. So oxygenated blood for both, and the VA ECMO in this slide you will see is present in both LV support device and RV support device. We'll talk more about this configuration, but the VA ECMO has a venous sheath that um, draws blood from the RA or IVC, then is transferred, so that's venous blood. It is then moved to an oxygenator where their venous blood is oxygenated and then delivered to the arterial uh, circulation. <clears throat> Another way to think about this is what is whether or not there's tubing around. So in, if there are no tubings, they are intracorporeal uh, devices. So balloon pump, impella, percutaneous heart pump, you don't see blood coming out of tubings. In contrast, tandem heart and VA ECMO uh, have both these tubes that come out of the body. In the case of VA ECMO, you will see dark blood return to bright blood after oxygenation. Now, when the mechanism of device, how these work, uh, most of the current pumps, uh, percutaneous heart pumps, are now continuous flow pumps. The balloon pump is the remaining pulsatile pump uh, that's uh, percutaneous that we are aware of. And so this is basically how you think about it. Now let's move to the next screen and discuss what an impella, uh, with the impella with more detail. So as I mentioned earlier, um, it is accessed in the uh, femoral artery and then advanced into the LV via an aortic valve. Blood is propelled 
Einstein and Peller, which is this asterisk right here. And if this is in the LV, blood is sucked by this inlet and then ejected just prior to this. This is an elegant slide because this line, vertical line, is actually where the aortic valve should sit. And the distance it shows you here just prior to the uh, inlet is three centimeters from the aortic valve. So the echogenic tip right here is actually about 3.5 to 4 centimeters um, from the aortic valve. Depending on which type of impella, uh, we have the 5.0 is a 21 French configuration that's surgically placed uh, by the surgeon. A graft has to be sewn in to the axillary artery, and that can deliver up to 5 liters of support. The impella CP is a 14 French configuration and can give you 3.5 liters of, of support. <clears throat> the next slide shows you the tandem heart. Again, this is a femoral vein access, uh, goes through the right atrium, and the interatrial septum has to be punctured. Uh, and from there, uh, the ven venous tubing is passed into the left, atrial, uh, left atrium. As one can imagine, a transesophageal echo is essential, number one, to guide interatrial septal puncture. And number two, to make sure that the left atrial appendage uh, is free of thrombi, because oftentimes uh, this venous, this cannula um, can sit in the left atrial appendage. The blood that is removed from this configuration is oxygenated, and then it's returned <clears throat> by the femoral artery. It can support up to four to five liters of support, and it does not require intrinsic cardiac function or perfusion rhythms. The idea how this helps the left ventricle is basically by unloading the LV preload, uh, the LV, um, it will then reduce your wedge pressure, your RV afterload, and improve myocardial oxygen demand. It also allows distal uh, vascular perfusion to prevent like ischemia. This is a slide to show you the different forms of left ventricular assist devices and note that compared to the balloon pump, the the access sizes are significantly much larger. And <clears throat> the VA ECMO, I have yet to discuss. The VA ECMO, as we said, is a venous cannula uh, placed in the IVC or right atrium. It then shunts the blood, venous blood, to an oxygenator, an extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, and returns it via the femoral artery. Now, the way that it is supposed to help the left ventricle is it reduces the RV volume, decreases LV preload, and with that helps the LV unload a little bit. The problem with that, I think, is that in patients with very, very weak hearts, they can have uh, inability to eject the blood. As you can see, when blood is then shunted into the femoral artery, it increases blood pressure by means of increasing peripheral vascular resistance. And with that, if the heart is weak enough, it cannot eject blood out, and that will be clinically seen by an arterial line that is flattened. So the VA ECMO may not unload the heart completely, and it may need venting. So this is a uh, shown in this following slide. Very busy slide, but I'd like you to focus on this blue uh, pressure volume loop for, for a little bit. At the end of diastole, this is where the, uh, the LV and diastolic volume is, around 175 cc's. This blue line is the arterial elastins, which is a systemic representation of uh, uh, systemic vascular resistance. As the VA ECMO support is increased, the afterload increases, and as you can see, the heart is then pushed a little bit more towards the right and it dilates a little bit more. Another thing that one can see very clearly from this pressure volume loops is that the stroke volume, the distance from end systole and end vasole is actually decreased. So if one then thinks of an echocardiogram, 
the LV is being distended so much more and ejects so much less as a result of increased absolute resistance. And one can help unload the left ventricle by putting in an impeller, for instance, or a balloon pump, something to uh, eject blood out from the left ventricle um, to the uh, aorta. RV failure associated with cardiogenic shock is independently associated with worse outcomes. And so recognizing that, we have now more RV support devices available. Uh, among them is the VA ECMO. Second is the Impella RP, wherein uh, this is a transvenous configuration, then advanced to the pulmonary artery. See the inflow basically uh, displaces blood from the IVC and moves it straight to the pulmonary artery. Um, the disadvantage of this is that it does not have an oxygenator and would depend on the lungs uh, to oxygenate venous blood that's being shunted to the lungs. The beauty of the Tandem Heart Protect Duo cannula, the oxy is that it, it shunts blood from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery but it can have an oxygenator attached to it. So venous blood that is shunted from the right atrium can go out, get oxygenated, and return to the pulmonary oxygenated if needed. That is the main difference between an impella RP and the time of heart. The right ventricle is and should be quantitatively assessed as much as possible if we have time. So some of the parameters that are associated with RV dysfunction is fractional area change. Normally, you can see fractional area change of less than 35% is associated with RV dysfunction. A TAPSI uh, measured in the lateral annulus here in the apical four chamber view of less than 16 is associated with RV dysfunction, as well as the S prime of less than 10. And these were uh, in the guidelines into uh, RV dysfunction. So most of these patients who have cardiogenic shock already have some form of echo available. However, in those patients who have never been in the medical system and has never been as new to you and they present the shock, so echocardiography is important to define, but we need to be able to do focused and expedited use since time equals muscle. So here are the views that I would suggest, actually parasternal long axis view, the apical four chamber view, and the subcostal views are the uh, three most important to get. Okay, and The parasternal long axis view is by far uh, where you will have the most information garnered with one single view, and that is basically uh, an idea of left ventricular internal diameter size on regional wall motion abnormalities. One can look at mitral regurgitation, aortic insufficiency, as well as aortic uh, root size. The apical four chamber view gives us an idea of what the right ventricle looks like. And it is on this view that one should then adopt the interventricular septum in order to look for VSDs. Um, the parasternal long and the apical four chamber view are complementary views to look at the mitral uh, valve in cases wherein you can have cordal rupture or papillary muscle rupture that causes severe mitral regurgitation. Subcostal views, of course, go standard for determining uh, the uh, extent of pericardial effusion. And so that, with that background, with that theoretical background, let us now look at some cases where we can use echocardiography to guide which mechanical circulatory support device to pick. Now, in this case, uh, one can readily see from those two views that I mentioned earlier uh, which mechanical circulatory support not to pick. Clearly, these apical thrombi here that are dangling uh, would be significantly dangerous if one were to put an LV to AO device to support a cardiogenic shock patient. The next case is this, someone who already had an impella device placed the day prior and in the process of bathing, um, the impella was dislodged and was alarming out of position. A quick echocardiogram at bedside shows that the impella is actually right at the ascending aorta. And with fortunate for us, with <clears throat> slight advancement of this device at bedside, um, the patient 
it, it went it went through pretty nicely because the aortic valve is 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 not that sclerosed or calcified. Now there is a problem with just pushing the impella into the LV, uh, as demonstrated by this. First, you can see that the pigtail is actually touching the inferolateral wall of the left ventricle, causing a ventricular uh, significant non-sustained VT. Okay. If we leave this position as is, the inflow cannula would increase suction and therefore potentially catch on to the mitral cordae apparatus and cause more mitral regurgitation. We then reposition the impella, as mentioned, the optimal position would be 3.5 to 4 centimeters from the aortic uh, valve. Uh, and I show you this picture. Um, sometimes the echogenic tip is not very clear. Um, so application of color doppler can help show blood flow in this inlet and that can be a guide where you can measure from in this case after a little bit of torque and and um, <clears throat> advancement we were able to get it to 3.5 uh, uh, liter support no problem this is a gentleman who had an mi who came in two weeks ago uh, stopped taking his meds and presented in cardiogenic shock third degree heart block inferior STEMI and was found to have uh, stent uh, thrombosis, complete occlusion of the previous stent that was placed. Despite revascularization, uh, there was TIMI-3 flow, and the ST elevation never resolved. Uh, with dopamine and epinephrine, this patient actually had uh, persistent shock, and these echo views were obtained. Um, the left ventricle seems to be uh, contracting well here in the parasternal lung as well as APO4. Right ventricle, though, seems to be uh, struggling quite a bit. And in this case, the contrast uh, really demonstrated how uh, RV was dysfunctional and as well as the TAPSI of all of it, it's severely reduced. So in this case, a right-sided support device was placed, and this was a tandem protect dual device, um, oxy -Harbet. Unfortunately, he rested and, and never made it. Now, the final case that I'd like to show you is that of a young lady, previously healthy, no significant medical history, who presented with just vague symptoms of fatigue uh, and unwellness. She has some more PVCs on her EKG, otherwise benign. And so an echocardiogram performed the day prior to her PT storm are as such. You see that the LV is not quite entirely normal, but squeezes better than the right ventricle. Within a few hours, uh, this is the tricuspid regurgitation that she has. Uh, the right, right ventricle seems much bigger than the left ventricle for sure. Her S prime is under 10. Her TAPSI in this case is only about 0.6. <clears throat> this patient went into VT storm within the next 12 hours of her hospital stay, and antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, various ones that were tried, were uh, unsuccessful. She had to be intubated, and when she was in cardiogenic shock, brought down to the cath lab for VA ECMO. Now, with this echo in mind, uh, the VA ECMO was placed, and however, as soon as she came up to the CVICU, an art line place shows that it was completely uh, non pulsatile although supported by the VA ECMO. We then obtained a quick echo, and this is now what the left ventricle looked like. Um, her EF has dropped significantly as well and was not was distended uh, and not ejecting, and therefore she was brought back to the cath lab for uh, a venting strategy, and in this case, an impella uh, was placed. So what you see is a VA ECMO, this is the swan dance catheter, and this is the impella. <clears throat> she had acute myocarditis, and we pulsed her with steroids, and then successfully weaned her off these biventricular support. At one year, April of last year, this is now what her heart looks like. The LV has resumed normal function, and her RV is still not quite normal, but much better than baseline. This is her S prime, almost close to 10, 
as her TAPSI of 1.5. So the role of echo in cardiogenic shock management can be seen as before MCS placement, and it's to define the anatomy of the heart and to aid which MCS to pick, uh, to look for contraindications basically with limited echo, and to perform these expeditiously. The three views that I recommend are the patterson or long axis view, the apical four chamber view, and the subcostal views. After these devices are placed, we then troubleshoot for alarms. In this case, I showed you impella uh, repositioning, and then facilitate weaning as we de-escalate support from these mechanical circulatory support devices with the hope of getting them off. So which temporary mechanical circulatory support, uh, support device do we pick? Do we pick? Uh, first, we have to define which ventricle needs support, how much support is needed. The impella, for instance, has 2.5 up to 5 liters of support that can be uh, implanted for a patient. And it's oxygenation required. These extracorporeal devices, the VA ECMO and the tandem heart, has the capacity to provide an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, provide, you know, if, if the lung ventilation oxygenation is not sufficient. And most of the time, though, with the device that is available uh, becomes the, the device of choice and, of course, local center expertise and experience. The, the tandem heart um, is rather difficult and requires extra uh, skill set in crossing the interatrial septal, uh, septum with, uh, in, in cases of acute shock, uh, becomes less uh, feasible. We then move to the second part of our talk, and we will be talking about surgically implanted uh, ventricular assist devices. This, this graph shows you the number of patients who, in red, who have an LVAD uh, implanted uh, to them. Uh, and as of September 30, 2017, there's about close to 21,000 patients supported by that. There's about 160 centers, uh, hospitals that implant LVADs. And you know, while, while the best treatment for patients with chronic systolic heart failure who has progressed to end stage is heart transplantation, the number of available donor hearts are limited, and they are stated to support that most of these patients that are um, bridged to transplant are actually having implanted with an LVAD to prevent weightless mortality. We have gone a long way. Um, this graph shows you that since 2001, the medical therapy uh, for end-stage heart disease uh, is, has very poor outcomes. A one year, for instance, in the rematch trial, there's only 25% survival uh, patients, a one year for patients who are treated medically. And when they're implanted with the first generation uh, heart mate or a post flow LVAT, the survival almost doubled. Fast forward to 2009, it's this destination therapy, they hand, then tested continuous flow devices versus pulse valve flow devices, first generation, and found that there's further improvement between 70 to 72 percent uh, with continuous flow LVADs uh, compared to the pulse valve flow, which is almost superimposable with the 2001 uh, data. More recently, we have uh, a study that tested the HeartMate 2 versus HeartMate 3. The axial flow pump is the HeartMate 2, and the centrifugal flow pump is the HeartMate 3. Again, we show further improvement of survival at uh, 84% in one year compared to 74% in one year, and this benefit extends all the way up to two years. The difference between the two comp flow configuration is that the HeartMate 2 is an axial flow pump, so what it does is from the inflow cannula, blood is uh, sucked from the left ventricle and then shunted via this uh, coaxially, via this rotor, and then shunted to the ascending aorta. The HeartMate 3 and the HVADs 2 are <coughs> centrifugal pumps. And what these does is these are intrapericardially placed. It shunts blood from the left ventricle and using an impeller, uh, blood is then transferred to 
to the outflow graph in a 90 degree configuration, whereas in this case it is almost coaxial to the to the rotor. The HeartMate 3 has a larger casing uh, improved to, and therefore improved by compatibility. It also gives you intermittent pulse utility of less than 20 uh, millimeters mercury. And as we can see here, the problems that we saw uh, on HeartMate 2 commonly, pump thrombosis, stroke and bleeding, are much lower in patients who have uh, HeartMate 3. So in, to the left of Unity, are uh, conditions that favor heart mate 3. So pump thrombosis is 1.4% versus 14%. And decreased stroke rate, decreased disabling uh, stroke, decreased bleeding, especially GI bleeding among patients who are implanted with heart mate 3. And this was just recently published at the New England Journal of Medicine. Before we talk about uh, LVADs, however, uh, we have to take a step back and say which patients with systolic heart failure who then progress to end-stage uh, heart disease can be a candidate for LVADs. Uh, so to assess, to assess the candidacy, first and foremost, the Medicare would pay only for patients with LVEF of less than 25%. And ideally, we want patients whose uh, left ventricular internal diameter is over 6.3 centimeters. Uh, those that have less than 6.3 centimeters have been shown in some series that uh, with associated with worse survival. With LVADs, the left ventricle is protected, but the right ventricle would have to bear the load. Um, and we want to make sure uh, once an LVAD is implanted that the RV will be able to sustain the additional volume that, <clears throat> that it has to take with more LV decompression. There are some parameters associated with RV dysfunction after implantation of an LVAD, and these are TAPSI of less than 0.75 and the RV to LV ratio of greater than uh, 0.75. So RV in this case is measured at the base of the apical four chamber view, RV focused uh, view, and then the LV in this case would be the LV IDD measured from the parasternal long axis view. In addition to these, we have to kind of a look for the presence of aortic insufficiency and tricuspid regurgitation uh, to aid the surgeons uh, in the decision whether or not to fix these. The tricky thing about aortic insufficiency is that in patients who have chronic AI and high LVDP, now chronic AI patients with uh, have usually low diastolic blood pressures and therefore low MAPs. And then if the low MAP is then compared to the gradient in the left ventricle that's high, so the MAP to LVEDTP gradient will become small. Therefore, the aortic insufficiency, this real degree of aortic insufficiency may not be manifest. The same is true for uh, PFOs. It is harder to detect PFOs, a right to left shunt, when the left atrial pressure is so much more, is so much higher uh, pre vad uh, and post that. In our echoes, we always do contrasted study to look for uh, LV thrombi. At the same time, if we have uh, uh, saline contrast studies to look for um, PFOs. Once we have decided that the patient is an adequate uh, candidate for LVAD uh, implantation, then they, <clears throat> on the day of intraoperative uh, study, we look at baseline studies, a full TE at baseline before any uh, surgical implantation. We assess the LV and the left atrial, uh, left atrial appendage for thrombi. We look for the degree of mitral regurgitation, again, aortic insufficiency and PFO, and we assess the RB function at baseline. <clears throat> the trans esophageal echo can also guide the surgeon with regard where is the optimal uh, placement of the inflow cannula, okay? And once an LVAD is placed, I'll show you some more pictures uh, in the next few slides. We can use the TE to assess positioning of the LVAD inflow cannula, assess the inflow velocity as well as outflow graft. 
Whenever we make changes intraoperatively, it is best to annotate these uh, so that people who are not in the case can follow what is actually happening in the OR. Once an LVAD is placed, we need to carefully de-air and look at the left ventricle, left atrium, ascending and descending aorta, because once an infl an, in order to implant an, uh, the inflow cannula, the LV apex has to be cored, and that will naturally introduce air into the left ventricular system. At the time that the patient comes off the cardiopulmonary bypass and goes on the mechanical ventilation, that is another period wherein the airing needs to be carefully assessed. Once LVAD support is in place for a little bit, it is best to reassess again for the presence and true severity of aortic insufficiency, PFO, when the LV's uh, left-sided pressures now would have been um, significantly reduced. Once the chest is closed, the RV assessment is also key. Now, moving from intraoperative uh, to now patients who have been implanted with LVAD, first we do surveillance echoes. And the difference between surveillance echoes and uh, RAMP studies or speed optimization studies is that these involve no speed changes. What we are doing is to evaluate the adequacy of FAD uh, function and support and to search for factors contributing to abnormal findings on VAD interrogations, low PIs, high flows, et cetera, et cetera. There are certain image acquisitions that are unique to patients with LVAD. Okay. So first and foremost, I tell the sonographers to always review the prior LVAD and look at the orientation of the parasitic long axis view. Um, we always look, always annotate the, annotate the type of LVAD on screen and then make annotate the speed changes and the map. The inotrope dose, uh, that would be so much of a plus to have, but I don't think that's often happening. And whatever uh, queer uh, position changes that you obtain images from, always annotate. Always show the aortic valve annulus. Going back to the LV, what is the purpose of the first point? Is that the left ventricular internal diameter is by far the most reproducible way of um, assessing uh, LV volumes. And in patients wherein, in cases wherein we try to compare LVs, you want to have the orientation as similar as possible. So I ask my sonographers to say, look at what the prior LVAP position is. If it's if the apex pointed at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, then when you measure these, just try to mimic that as much as possible and, of course, get the best view uh, as much as possible so that when we compare the LVIDD size, LV size, we are comparing, not comparing apples to oranges. <clears throat> we, moving forward, we always try to get the LVAD inflow and outflow images, get the color, get the max velocity, pulse wave uh, Doppler and continuous wave Doppler uh, for, for both of these scenarios. And of course, we try to always have quantitative RV function assessment. What are we looking for uh, in these uh, surveillance echoes? We look at size and function. I mentioned before that we use LVIDD uh, as this is the most reproducible. Volumetric assessment of the LT is more accurate. However, these are limited, and most certainly our sonographers will tell you these <laughs> have a lot of uh, image acquisitions already. And um, the, the LVIDD by far is the way to go. The aortic valve opening at the current set LVAD speed is always assessed. We want intermittent uh, aortic valve opening to prevent long-term complications such shut aortic valves can cause, such as aortic insufficiency, as well as formation of thrombus and the aortic valve leaflets. We look for the presence or absence of aortic insufficiency. We'll talk more about how to quantify these. We look for the absence and presence of mitral regurgitation at the present fat speed and how we can improve those. The inflow cannula position and the outflow cannula position is always assessed. We look for the position of the interventricular septum at the apical four-chamber view, quantify RV function, and look at the severity of tricuspid regurgitation. The IVC gives us an idea of what the uh, right atrial pressure is, and together with 
if you get PR jet can give us an estimation of what the right ventricular systolic pressure is. Now, when speed changes are being made as a result of an abnormal uh, surveillance study, uh, this is either for speed optimization or for uh, looking for uh, problems. When we say ramp studies, this we suspect a potentially uh, fat thrombosis, which can be clinical or subclinical. And speed optimization is finding the best LVAD speed um, possible. Now, this is a as an elegant study done at the University of Chicago, wherein a, a speed optimization study um, was done in order to define in, in patients implanted with HeartMate 2 and HeartMate 3 to see what the effect of optimized um, right heart cath parameters are in terms of outcomes, uh, mortality, as well as hospital uh, free readmissions within one year period of time. As you can see here, there were um, patients, they have to have all three uh, scenarios met. Right atrial pressure has to be less than 12. The wedge pressure has to be less than 18. And the FIC calculated cardiac index has got to be greater than 2.2. Um, about 39% of patients uh, were not able to meet any of the criteria. And so for those patients who are optimized in red, they have much less readmissions uh, over the next year. Um, mortality is about the same. So how is the RAMP study different? In this case, we don't do uh, all the images associated with surveillance um, uh, fat echoes. We look at limited views. Now, first, we I just asked my sonographers to do parational long axis views for me, parational long short axis at the level of the aortic valve if I need to obtain the RVOT um, VTI as well as diameter to estimate the cardiac output. But most commonly, the apical four-chamber view, RV-focused, to look at the interventricular size, uh, the position, RV size and function, MR and tricuspid regurgitation um, as we increase the speed. Before I forget, at the parasitic long axis view, we always color doctor uh, the inflow cannula and obtain spectral uh, CW and PW uh, doctor as well to get the peak velocity. Now, in patients with RAMP, this is, again, two separate papers elegantly shown using 3D echo to see the effect of speed changes on the right and left ventricle, uh, supported by different um, FDA-approved LVAD, durable LVADs. On top of screen is the HeartMate 2. One can see that at the lowest RPM, the size of the LV is in gray, and the size of the RV is in red. When the speed is increased to the highest RPM, what happens to the left ventricle is that it goes from a more spherical to a more conical shaped uh, uh, chamber, and the right ventricle goes from a slightly smaller to a bigger right ventricle. This happens when the speed increase uh, exceeds about 9 to 600, 10,000 RPMs. For the HVADs, the changes associated with Speed increases from lowest to highest in the LV is not very dramatic, and in the RV change is also not very dramatic. And several differences. First is that these are intracorporeally, I mean, intraperitoneally uh, placed pumps, and therefore the changes in the left ventricle may not, uh, under left and right ventricle, may not be as uh, as prominent. The heart rate three, however, uh, shows that with Changes in RPM from lowest to highest, the LV, again, is able to shift the change from a spherical to a more conical shape, and the RV goes from smaller uh, to bigger. What is the implication of this? We want to find a point, uh, and, and at this point, we have no idea what the cut point is, wherein enough speed change is able to decompress the left ventricle without carrying well, causing long-term RV dysfunction, uh, late RV failure. As you can see, increasing the speed simply to the highest uh, speed can cause problems. The RV gets bigger, and uh, as we are making the change one point in time in the cath lab or in the echo lab, 
Now, the long-term consequences of these are yet to, are yet known. Next, we'll talk about some of the ASE guidelines published in 2015. Um, here is a normal uh, inflow cannula position and function, as I mentioned. You know, TE is very useful in defining uh, this position intraoperatively. This is pointed straight at the um, uh, mitral valve apparatus to decrease uh, mitral valve 3D is, is good. And when you apply a PW at the mitral, inf uh, at the LVAD inflow cannula, one can get a maximum velocity as well. This should not exceed 1.5 meters per second. Examples of abnormal inflow malposition is this, um, you know, uh, one can see that if you increase the speed of the LVAD, uh, the, this has very little sp uh, space to decompress and would cause all sorts of rhythm abnormalities. From the echo standpoint, you will see turbulence in the outflow graph and variability in flow uh, as well. What should a normal functioning LVAD do? As we increase the speed from 8,000 to 11,000 RPM in this example, left ventricular size should decompress. So in this case, it's pointed at around 11 o'clock position. You can see the left ventricular end diastolic volume has decreased from 6.1 centimeters to 4.7 centimeters. <clears throat> and as the LVAD continues to decompress the left ventricle, it should also capture the aortic valve more. First focus on C, to D, and E. At 8,000 RPM, one sees an intermittent uh, you know, partial opening of the aortic valve at higher speed, 8600 intermittent opening of the aortic valve, and at 9000 complete closure of the aortic valve. I don't think this is what you want. This is a PE configuration at 9600 RPM showing intermittent uh, aortic valve opening, and at 9800 RPM, heart may two uh, support the aortic valve duration is almost as if the elvad is not there. So this is fully opening aortic valve, signaling potential problems with the LVAD. As patients with mitral, uh, you know, as patients are implanted with the LVAD, almost universally, the degree of mitral regurgitation uh, is improved with LV decompression, uh, especially for functional mitral regurgitation. This is an example when the LVAD speed is cranked up too high, 10,000 RPM, how it can cause suction or uh, you know, of the left ventricle, causing turbulence in flow. And this one was relieved by just dropping the speed by 400 RPM, causing uh, less um, problem within the intraventricular uh, system. One can see also that when the speed is cranked up too high, position of the interventricular septum would be bowed towards the left ventricle, and this would, in effect, cause some form of RV dysfunction down the road. Aortic insufficiency is a problem for patients with LVAD, and the traditional parameters that we use to quantify these cannot be applied to patients with AI and LVAD, and so the suggested parameter is to measure the vena contracta and should be, if it's more than three millimeters or 0.3 centimeters, it's at least moderate AI. And if the vena contracta jet width compared to the LVOT at 50 to 60 Nyquist limit, over 46%, that is moderate AI. Here in Doppler flow, we show you that the problem with AI in patients with LVAD is it's not just a diastolic abnormality. It expands all the way to the systolic part. In a normal uh, AI, for instance, we will have this, but it should not extend all the way to the systolic part of the curve. In patients with enough LV uh, contractility, it actually shows, it can show you this arrows. It's just forward flow. Uh, despite the aortic insufficiency, so it's able to fight the intrinsic uh, flow. Color M mode will also show this. Um, these arrows show that there's partial aortic valve opening, but it should not be that there is uh, extension of these color doppers into the, supposed to be electrical and mechanical uh, uh, quiescence in terms of um, aortic insufficiency. This is a paper by Nero Yale um, looking at Doppler of the pulse wave Doppler of the outflow graft and suggests the peak systolic to diastolic um, velocity of less than five 
as well as diastolic accelerate, uh, acceleration of more than 49 centimeters per second squared is associated with at least uh, moderate aortic insufficiency. In the interest of time, I will not go through the slide, but it's there for you to review. Um, and um, we'll skip this. In patients with abnormal outflow graft, once color Doppler is applied, you will see increased turbulence as well as increased velocity. It should not exceed two meters per second on the Elvad outflow graft. And these are the list of abnormalities that an Elvad uh, surveillance echo can identify. Um, the pericardial fusion causing plus causing tamponade or not can be shown early after um, surgery. The inadequate loading, LV filling, causing suction uh, can be seen when the LV is significantly decompressed less than three centimeters. We talked about continuous AI being a problem, and that's being a contractor greater than three millimeters. The aortic regurgitant jet you know, to the LVOT height of more than 46%. Inflow cannula abnormality, velocity over 1.5, and then outflow graft velocity abnormality uh, with more than two meters per second. So in general, echo for durable VADs uh, is used for speed optimization and is essential for troubleshooting VAD alarms, which can oftentimes lead to change in medical management. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I end this talk and open uh, forum for questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Howe. At this time, we will begin the Q&A session. From IAC ECHO, I'd like to introduce Sue Jensen and Ann Groves, our senior, cl senior clinical specialists. They'll be assisting with the Q&A session today. Sue, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, I'm going to ask you two questions just because these are possible contraindications. Uh, one, uh, Ms. Alina asked if use of contrast on patients with echo is a big no-no, and also is a bioprosthetic aortic valve a contraindication for a left-sided impella? These are kind of two questions going with the same concept. Yeah, the left-sided, um, the bioprosthetic valve in patients with cardiogenic shock, you do whatever it is uh, that you need to do to get this done, and it, it should not be a contraindication. Especially if it's already been implanted there for a while. Uh, you do whatever it takes to get the patient out of trouble, and that's uh, one of the things that you can do. And remember that the VA, uh, that the impella is not the only uh, device, but most certainly the presence of a bioprosthetic aortic valve is not a contraindication for implantation of an impella. And re remind me again the first question. Um, use of contrast with ECMO? Use of contrast with VA ECMO. Um, I'd like to clarify this now, um, saline contrast versus, uh, you know, the yeah. usual uh, left-sided contrast, I'm not sure, um, but saline contrast should not be a contraindication, but I wouldn't uh, imagine, cannot imagine a scenario why you would uh, do a saline contrast in these scenarios, um, and then contrast for ECMO. The, the, the example I cited was just to delineate the, the right and left side before the implantation of, uh, of a VA ECMO. Hmm. Okay, um, a question is asked, is strain useful in LBAD patients? That is an unknown at this time. I think, you know, before implantation of LBAD, there's data to say that an LV longitudinal strain that's uh, minus 9.6%, it's associated, <coughs> yes, associated with um, uh, poor outcomes, but um, it, this is a topic uh, that will be, uh, I'm sure, explored as we use more and more of these. I have a, a question from a children's hospital. They say they implant a Berlin heart. What type of vet is this and how do we assess differently? I have not used a Berlin heart, and I most certainly have no experience <laughs> um, <laughs> these in the pediatric population, so I would pass on that question. Okay. Um, someone's okay. just asking you, what is the RPM? I guess, that's the speed. I guess they want to know what the RPM is. They want to be specific on that, yeah. Per minute, that's what. Yep. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Frederick asks, is there an increase in blood cell lysis with increasing speed? Um, depends on which device. So for the uh, percutaneous fats, for instance, the impellus, uh, that is a known uh, problem. Uh, as you increase the speed, there's increased uh, risk of hemolysis. And what you see is that you know, this bilirubin goes up, the urine becomes dark. Um, for the durable uh, LVADs, um, not so much now. So the HeartMate 3, for instance, has better hemo uh, compatibility. And what that means is that less hemolysis for several reasons. Number one is that it has changed to a centrifugal configuration. It's magnetically levitated. And it's the casing wherein it sucks the blood into allows, it has more space, uh, allowing less hemolysis, less acquired von Willebrand factor, um, if that answers the question. Okay. So now someone's coming back about the contrast. They want to know about Definity contrast with Impella. Definity contrast with Impella we've used before. Uh, I don't think that that's a contraindication uh, for use. Um, okay. Um, Mindy asks, is there a recommended ECHO protocol for LVADs? Yes, and I would refer you to the ASC guidelines for LVADs in 2015. Uh, there's actually a protocol in place, and that's, that's what we use. All right, Rachel asks, is the 3D volume analysis desirable with LVAD in place, 3D? The 3D volume uh, was done. Analysis. 3D volume analysis, is it? yes. Uh, that is very yes. difficult, very time-consuming, but it was done uh, by uh, the group at University of Chicago. Most certainly, we don't do it routinely. This was done for uh, research purposes, but it was an elegant study. Okay, someone asks, what is the physiological difference between atrial and centrifugal pumps? Atrial. So there's axial, let's see, axial and centrifugal pump. Oh, yeah. right. So Sorry axial, if I misspoke. Yeah. The so centrifugal pumps basically uh, displaces blood. Uh, think of it as a fan. So if you have a fan, what it does, it sucks the blood down and then moves it uh, into a 90-degree position, at, at least in this uh, this uh, HeartMate 3 uh, configuration, right? The axial flow pumps, the blood is shunted coaxially. So blood moves uh, in the same direction as uh, the rotator, uh, as the impeller. That is the difference. And what it does is that because of the uh, axial, uh, it has to go through this ax ax axillary uh, pump, coaxial flow, um, there seems to be more hemolysis with this kind of configuration. Okay. Um, can you talk about why we should reevaluate for PFO after the LVAD is in place? Oh, yes. Uh, so PFO may not always be seen when, uh, right to left shunt at least, may not always be seen uh, when the left atrial pressure is so high compared to the right atrial pressure, especially patients with end stage disease. Now, once the LVAD is implanted uh, and let it run there for a while, the left-sided pressures will then begin to come down. Uh, and then, so uh, if one were to evaluate for PFOs, that would be important. Uh, that is when one would see uh, possibly uh, more right uh, to left shunts. The same for aortic insufficiency. Uh, as I said, with very high left ventricular end diastolic pressure and low mean arterial pressure, the gradients would be so different to show us the real extent of the aortic insufficiency. Once the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is lowered by LVAD support, then one can see the gradient increase and can see the true nature of the severity of the aortic insufficiency. And can diastolic function be assessed in patients with LVAD? <clears throat> Diastolic dysfunction uh, in LVAD um, has not been, I think, validated uh, with, with the usual 
uh, way we are used to measuring them. But um, most of the times, uh, we use them as a guide, but it's not 100% uh, uh, accurate. We, we usually, if there's a question, we do a right heart cast together with an, uh, an echocardiogram. Correlate, but that's most certainly something that should be uh, looked at. Okay, do we have time for one more question? Okay, yeah, someone wants to know what view do you suggest measuring the RV dimension to calculate the LV RV ratio? So that paper used the um, apical four chamber view, the RV focused, and then basically measure at the base of the right ventricle. Uh, the diameter of what the RV is, and then the LVIDD is basically obtained from the parasternal long axis view and get the uh, distance from that. Do the ratio, anything over 0.75 is associated with worse outcome, uh, more RV dysfunction. Okay, um, if that's all the questions we have, then um, thanks again to everyone and a very special thank you to Dr. Howe for his presentation today. Please feel free to contact IAC with questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars, look for the title of this session, The Utility of Echocardiography in Patients with VADS. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event, then click on the Evaluation tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation. <laughs>